Are we live? Okay. We're just getting it set up. Hi, everybody. Hey, Greg, if you're there, hi. <laughs> and Christine. <laughs> So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Shea and our esteemed panel of new online teaching ambassadors for 2016. Um, we are um, uh, doing a panel on the formation of faculty attitudes towards online teaching, which is in conjunction with some research that we're running. I'll let Peter talk more about that. But I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Joanne Souza. Raise your hand. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Alicia uh, Grace Chase um, uh, from Brockport and Kathleen Borby uh, from Monroe Community College. Peter, I'll let you do further. Maybe they can introduce themselves a little further. Okay, well, thanks for having us. I'm start, sorry we're getting started a little late. Um, I want to do a quick research project right here, right now. Everybody, get ready. <laughs> By a show of hands, how many of you are faculty? Okay, okay. By a show of hands, how many of you accept the value and legitimacy of online learning? <laughs> Holy crap! It's 100%. <laughs> this is going to be good. I like this. This is good. That, this is just to make a point about uh, representative sampling and distributions can be very different depending on where you get your sample from. So we're going to talk about uh, faculty attitudes about online learning. I think we've heard a lot of people talk today about how much education matters, how, uh, how much it matters because it's beneficial not only economically, but socially, cognitively, uh, health-wise. There's so many benefits uh, to participation in higher education. And being excluded from that participation has profound consequences. So what we're doing with online education primarily is increasing access to people who would otherwise not have access to higher education and all the tremendous benefits that accrue from that. Um, we're talking about attitudes towards online learning. Everybody in this audience has a positive attitude about online learning, but that is very uh, rare. Uh, it's very rare to find those kinds of attitudes. That distribution of attitudes is not a common uh, occurrence. I'm going to show you some data that indicates that nationwide uh, attitudes may be somewhat different or probably be considerably different if we have faith in the data. And my hypothesis, and I think a lot of people would agree, it's kind of commonsensical, people who have negative attitudes are unlikely to do things that they have negative attitudes about. And that you know, unwillingness to do things like online learning has serious consequences for its growth and for extending access to all the benefits of higher education. So what do we know about faculty attitudes? I think there's <laughs> two primary sources of, of data. Um, there's been national studies that have been conducted by Babson Survey Research Group. Everybody who ever writes a paper about online learning starts with Allen and Seaman say this. Uh, and so they are like a very, very uh, common uh, resource. So they've done stuff on what do chief academic officers feel about their faculty attitudes. And then there's been a series of surveys that have been done by Gallup and Inside Higher Education. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So the Babson Survey Research Group stuff. How many people are familiar with uh, Babson Survey Research Group, Alan Seaman stuff? Ten years of research on chief academic officers' beliefs about the st you know, strategic value of online education. And they've always asked about faculty attitudes. For every year that they've asked chief academic officers, Every institution in the United States, how do your faculty feel about online education? Do your faculty accept the value and legitimacy of online education? Uh, it's reported that uh, by 33% of faculty accept the value and legitimacy. This past year, I think it was 29%. So it's hovered up right around 30%. It goes up and down, but not very, very much. So 
chief academic officers don't b believe nationwide that their faculty accept the value and legitimacy of online education. That has, I think, some potential uh, consequences. But what about faculty themselves? How do they, when we survey faculty directly, how do they feel? So Gallup and Inside Higher Education have done uh, at least four years of national studies. Um, here's the one from 2012, conflicted faculty in online education. And if you look at that one, it's, it brings up faculty are less excited and more fearful about online education than academic uh, technology administrators. 2013, you see that one in five faculty agree that their um, learning outcomes from online are equivalent to classroom-based outcomes. Even faculty who have taught online have those negative attitudes. 2014, online ed skepticism and self-sufficiency a majority of faculty members with online teaching experience still say those courses produce results inferior to in-person courses and partial credit 2015, the most recent year that they've done a national study. The gap between administrators and faculty members widens as instructors, including those who have taught online, become more negative about the quality of online education, especially compared to face-to-face -face instruction. So four years of national studies, all four years indicating profound skepticism, and if you look at the numbers, I mean, they're almost, you know, too bleak to believe. I would say they're not almost too bleak to believe, they are actually too bleak to believe. Uh, the percentage of faculty who strongly agree that online is as good as face-to-face -face nationally, 5%. That means 95%, 5%. do not have strong agreement, do not strongly endorse that statement, 95% of faculty, right? What the hell's going on here? Is there something wrong with online education? Is it in inherently inferior? Is it? Reading that stuff, I think if I was not well-versed in this, I would come away with, yeah, there must be something wrong. Right? There must be something wrong. That is the dominant narrative that's out there about faculty attitudes right now. The empirical evidence, on the other hand, could not be more different. Uh, 15 meta-analytic studies comparing online and face-to-face -face instruction all come up with the same result. They all come up with they are not significantly different. As you look at newer meta-analytic studies, online students appear to be doing somewhat better than classroom students. So you have thousands and thousands and thousands of studies summarized in meta-analytic uh, studies. And they all come up with the same answer. Online education is at least as good and can be as good and can be better than classroom-based instruction. So there's a problem here. There's a mismatch between empirical evidence and perception, right? That colors, I think, faculty attitudes towards online learning and colors the public's attitudes about online learning. I think if you look a little bit deeper into these studies, do faculty really feel that online learning is inferior? We look at these numbers again. First, we should take a hard look at the fine print in these studies. Um, these data are not statistically adjusted because of survey non-response. The results from the sample represents the view of only those who participate in the survey. It, doesn't, it cannot be generalized to faculty across the United States. That's buried in the Gallup poll studies, the, the internet and higher education studies. That's not something that gets highlighted. So none of these surveys are representative beyond the respondents, not to US faculty. So, but even if they were, even if they were, if you look at experienced versus inexperienced faculty, you'll see that 41% of experienced faculty, and this was two years ago, agree that online learning outcomes are equivalent and a minority of experienced online faculty would disagree with that. The rest are ambivalent about whether they're uh, equivalent or not. But that's, these are just the survey respondents. This is not nationally representative data. If you look at um, outcomes of experienced versus inexperienced faculty, you see a sort of uh, mirror images at, with the national data. Experienced faculty believe that outcomes are equivalent. Inexperienced faculty do not believe that. And we replicated this study in SUNY. I think probably some folks were here 
or at different meetings, CIT last year, where we uh, presented results of our replication study of the Gallup survey. We got permission from Gallup to do a replication study. We had over 400 responses, respondents from uh, SUNY schools. And we have much better results than national results are reported today. Uh, almost 76% of SUNY faculty agree that online and face-to-face -face are equivalent, and only 13% of experienced faculty would disagree with that. So we have, you know, you know, miles ahead. The community in SUNY is miles ahead of what the faculty nationally are reported to be. If you look at inexperienced faculty nationally versus SUNY, the inexperienced faculty uh, are most in doubt about the equivalence of online education in the courses they teach. Uh, faculty who have not experienced, who have never taught an online course, are most in doubt about the equivalence of online education in their own courses. They say, oh, it could work well at another institution. Oh, it might even work okay at mine, maybe in my department, I'm not sure. In my courses, it would never work, right? <laughs> it's, it's an interesting <laughs> set of perspectives. For f experienced faculty, it's exactly the opposite. They say, yeah, it probably works okay at other institutions. I think it works a little better at my institution. In fact, in my department, it works even better. And in my courses, it's no doubt about it. These are, these are equivalent outcomes. So the more experience people have, the better their attitude is about it, the more accepting they are, and I think the more uh, informed they are. So we're doing this research study. We have a, a, a four-quadrant mo uh, model. Right now, the narrative is very black and white. It's like, faculty don't like this. We, we, we did the study. We did the survey. We don't really know why faculty might not like it. We really don't know if they do or don't like it because the uh, studies are not representative. But what we're trying to unpack is there are ex uh, faculty who have taught online. There's faculty who have never taught online. And our faculty have positive attitudes. Faculty have negative attitudes. And they can for fall in any one of these four quadrants. <coughs> At this event, we've been collecting data on faculty who are experienced with online teaching and who have positive attitudes. So we're filling out this first quadrant, and Daphne and uh, <laughs> our research team, Lisa uh, and Zhao and, um, and Jen Boisbert, <laughs> who's not here today, have, and uh, Guo Chen, have all been interviewing people here and will continue to do interviews. Uh, Daphne's doing this as part of her doctoral dissertation. Alex has, is also part of the team and has facilitated our access to so many folks. We really appreciate it. So what we're trying to understand is, you know, under these conditions, how do people get these attitudes? Why would inexperienced faculty have positive attitudes? Why would inexperienced faculty have negative attitudes? Why would experienced faculty have negative attitudes? And why do experienced faculty have positive attitudes? So that's sort of the uh, deeper dive we're trying to do on the survey results that we did. The survey is being presented at ARA. This is an ongoing uh, active research uh, study. What we want to know is what is you know what does this tell us about theory? You know, can we have a model that describes, explains, and predicts? this phenomenon, and what does it tell us about practice? How can we under use this information to better uh, provide better support to faculty? So I'm going to sit down, um, and I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, I'd like to reintroduce our panel. Um, The questions we're going to be talking about are up on the screen. Can you guys see those? Yep. You can. Okay. So why don't we just go down, uh, um, and Alicia, maybe you can introduce yourself real quickly. I teach at SUNY Brockport. I'm an associate professor, and I'm the sole art historian uh, and historian of visual culture. So I work in a studio art department, and, and as the only art historian, and you heard me um, comment on the last speaker's. Um, talk, I said, you know, I'm already the redheaded stepchild, but I've made myself twice so by teaching online because there are, to, uh, to date, no studio classes that are even in a hybrid model on our campus. And so all of my colleagues in my department teach, you know, not just face to face, but two and a half hours at a session. And so they think that my online learning is, you know, fluff and that, you know, I must sit at home in my pajamas and twiddle my thumbs. So. Okay. Thanks. 
I'm Kathleen Borby, and I'm an associate professor in uh, business at Monroe Community College, and I teach uh, marketing, sales, uh, business applications. I came to MCC seven years ago after spending 30 years with IBM. I'm Joanne Souza. I'm faculty at Stony Brook University. I'm also the director of the Biology Online program. Uh, I originally started out at AT&T as a strategic analysis uh, person for health and education. So I was part of the uh, industry consultant for communications within the education system. I came back to academia because I was interested in how and what people learn under hierarchical learning situations versus democratic learning situations or structures. Um, and that's been the focus of my research all along. Um, do you want me to how I came into so online Yeah, so why don't we start with the first yeah. question. How did you come to be teaching online? I, I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> fell into it. I did, fell into it because uh, I was helping to, I was assisting to teach a very large lecture class at Stony Brook. And because of my communications background, I realized that we, this um, talking head at the front of the room was not exactly democratic learning. So I looked to take the tools that I had learned uh, at AT&T and to turn it into more of an interactive classroom with discussions and with uh, interactive learning assets where students could debate the material. Falsification, like in science, we put that to work and gave students the time to think. So in other words, we opened up the platform so that students could think, they could research without just spontaneously answering. Okay. So what happened was it was just the spontaneous development that because the course became so successful, we went from a 52 average in the class to a 75 average in the class because we had a constant feedback between the discussions and faculty and fixing the lectures as we gave them. So what we did then was we had an unmet demand for the class uh, and we developed an online class during the summer for that unmet demand. And it was a very simple transition of good pedagogy from one platform to the other. Great. Okay. I too did not necessarily consciously say, oh, I will teach online. Um, I was an online learner without even thinking about it for years. Um, I mean, every month I'd have to take courses with IBM. We called it CAT, Computer Assisted Training. And so when I came to MCC, um, they said, you know, in my orientation, you know, well, our um, online platform for course management is Angel. And I thought, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. I took every Angel course they offered. We have an amazing instructional technologies department. And um, because of that, then they said, oh, you're uh, qualified to teach online. I said, oh, okay, I'll do that. And it just seemed like a natural progression. Um, in addition, um, at the same time, I had a daughter who had, was just starting to go to school at MCC at the same time. And she was taking a combination of both face-to-face -face and online courses. And you know, so I had that uh, opportunity to sort of watch her walk through her online courses. And I, you know, I was constantly asking her, so what do you think? You know, is online better than face-to-face? -face? And she would say, no, it's, it's, just, it's just different. She said, as a matter of fact, many of my online courses, she felt, were, were harder and more research-based. And, and she sometimes felt she even worked harder in her online courses. So I just got a whole, I got a student appreciation to, you know, while I was developing my online course, and it just seemed like a natural progression. I did not uh, conscientiously choose or consciously choose, well, like obviously I was conscious, but not necessarily intentional in my choice of online teaching. Um, I was already teaching during summer session, and I have a particularly old building in which I teach, and on any given day, it would get up to about 75 to 80 in my summer session classes, and they were four to five hours at a stretch, and my students just were not staying with me. Um, no matter how peppy I tried to be, no matter how many times we broke over the course of those four hours, I realized it was really not working. And so I thought, well, if we teach, if I teach this online, they'll be in an air-conditioned space somewhere, and I might have better results. Okay. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like anybody was necessarily influenced by colleagues, or it was no. not not persuaded by somebody else. You kind of just either 
fell into it, or it's a, it's a problem to a, a solution to a problem you had. It's a real practical problem. Practical right. Practical problem. I, as far as colleagues, for me, because I also was pursuing my PhD online from Lurie International, a Walden, uh, I was on both sides of the blackboard, basically. So everything that I saw that didn't work in an online class, I then moved over into my online class and fixed it. So I took what worked. I took over 130 credits online myself. Okay. So I took what worked and I brought it in, and I took what didn't work, and I fixed it. So colleagues, those colleagues were the students in my online classes uh, yeah. that influenced me, not so much my colleagues at Stony Brook. So it, it sounds like you either had experiences that predated your teaching online courses yourself, either in, as students in online courses, for, for, and, and you just saw it as a solution to a practical problem. I saw it as a solution to a practical problem, but one of the reasons I think I have a good effect with my students is because I have a section where it's about me um, on my um, you know, Blackboard platform, and I tell them how I started off as a traditional learner at Cornell as a freshman because my father wanted me to be an attorney, and I hated it, so I kind of went off to Boston and did a bunch of things, but I went to school at night and finished my BA that way. And um, I realized I basically had the equivalent of online learning 20 years ago. And so when I realized that, it made me much more empathetic and much more invested in who I was teaching because I realized I'd been in their shoes. Okay. And that made it much more real for me. So one of the things that we're trying to get at is in order for uh, faculty to accept and to not only try it, but to innovate with it, to excel on it, to stick with it. Are there kinds of supports that you got, either, either from your institution or from Open SUNY or from anywhere? Uh, I have to say that um, uh, I have a lot of support ha um, when I first started and today even more support from our Instructional Technologies Department. Um, we're very fortunate at Monroe Community College to have Dr. Larry Dugan um, he's been with us for about a year and a half now, and he's standing right out there. Uh, but, you know, I, I pass by the office, I can't tell you how many times a day, um, between my face-to-face -face classes, and I just pop in, and there's an instructional designer there, and I'll ask a question, and I'll whip out my PC, and I'll sit down, and they'll answer a problem for me right away. I mean, I'm very, very fortunate. I, I truly, truly am. Um, they, they've been amazing. And um, a little earlier in one of the, the sharing presentations, I said I was involved in COIL, the Collaborative Online International Learning. And I don't think I could possibly have pulled that whole thing off without a um, collective set of support personnel from our library, from Larry Dugan's organization. Um, it was really kind of like, oh, yeah, we're going to do this, you know, because I was the first one in my institution to ever do it. And we all just pulled it together, and there was there were a lot of nail-biting um, technology issues, and when you're trying to connect and you see somebody on the screen and they're in Mexico and you've got this time clock taking away and your students are going to be presenting in five minutes and things are not working, you need a good set of support people to help you out, and that's what I have. I'm very, very fortunate to have that. What I found, Peter, is that when from the business world, from working in the business I did, which was mostly large businesses, and I had Board of Education for the city of New York as an account. What people's objection is, what they voice, is usually not what the real objection is. Uh, what they say and what is the real objection is something that you have to dig for. And normally what I found is that with faculty that I deal with, because I have tenure track uh, research faculty that are teaching our online courses with us. Mm -hmm. That if you, if they have the support and they have the resources, they will do it. That the problem with the negative attitude, and they'll just grab anything, a buzzword that says, you know, whatever the reason their objection is. The real objection is if there's no revenue, they're not, they're not naive. If there's no revenue to support what's needed, then they're going to have a negative attitude. If, if it's there, if the, re the resources are there and they're being distributed to the boots on the ground people who are actually doing the support, mm -hmm. then the positive attitude will emerge as an effect. Okay. And that's pretty much what I found because of the faculty that we have. It's not something I just thought, it's something we implemented. Mm -hmm. And it, it has been very successful. And Stony Brook has been very good right now as far as the biology online program and redistributing the revenue to the groups on the ground to make it a sustainable model. 
my question is, can they, you know, can we continue to do that if it's not a statewide type of model? Yeah. I'm very lucky at SUNY Brockport. I have always had Karen Shuley Williams, who runs our SUNY Learning Network, and um, then Ann Graco Perlman um, helped me with my course design and implementation, and Chris Price is there as well and uh, he would give me my kind of moral support and when I um, decided whether or not I was going to do open book testing um, I remember that he said to me well why can't the moment of a assessment also be the moment of acquisition and I asked him to explain and he said you know in a face-to-face -face format class when a student doesn't have the answer um, they probably never go look it up ever again they get their test back and they walk out of the door and yet, when you give an open book um, test online, the student has the chance to acquire that knowledge. If for the first time then, they still acquire it. And ha having conversations like that and having people I could bounce my ideas off of and just the technical support uh, was, I think, what kept me going. Because the moments that were challenging, I already had a community who could discuss those things with me. So it sounds like you know there was a very positive influence on the support that you had towards your attitude to persist with it, to maybe to innovate with it, to try new things. Is there, were there any downsides to any of this? Did you experience any challenges? Have you, you obviously you've experienced challenges. What are the, some of the biggest challenges you've experienced? Continuing their model, the revenue model, as money got tighter and tighter, uh -huh. I think. Um, for us, that's basically what the problem is. Because people like to problem solve, they love to. And if you give them the time, and the freedom to problem solve, they will, but they need the resource support. And if they don't have the resource support, the, the resource support, they can't be successful at what you're asking them to do. And as I said, they're not naive. Mm -hmm. They know when they can be successful and when they can't. And when they can't, that's the obstacle. Yeah. The people will not join you in, and I don't care how much you rah-rah them, it isn't going to work, because they in intuitively know that this is not a successful enterprise, that I should be redistributing my time towards. But if we could fix the revenue return model, I think you'd see a lot more people suddenly become positive. Okay. Are the challenges that you've confronted that were, um, maybe I, were dampening your enthusiasm, but you managed yeah, to? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, there were definitely times, um, certainly last semester, when I was sort of immersed in this um, online international uh, project that I kept saying to myself, oh my God, I, well, I, what am I doing to myself? What, I, I did this, oh, okay, be positive. You want to model what you want out of your students. And I had to do a lot of self-talking because uh, the, there just seemed to be so many different things and coming at me. But, uh, and then I realized I would have to consciously tell myself, step back, you've got a support group here. You know, Because oftentimes, I think sometimes as faculty, we, we tend to um, embrace this as our course, and, and we're, we're very parochial about what we've created. And I would just kind of say, oh, guys, I need some help. You know, I need this, I need that. And so our instructional technologist was always there for me to, to help me uh, make suggestions, um, bail me out, that kind of a thing. So I, I relied on them a lot, and I just had to keep telling myself, uh, accept help. Don't, don't this is this is really not your baby. This is something that you just happen to be doing for the first time, but you're going to be sharing it with the rest of the campus so that we can all learn from my mistakes. Okay. I want to get to the question of equivalence of outcomes. And I think it's a big um, result that's been reported for four years as a national study result. Do you feel like the outcomes in the classes you teach online are equivalent to the classes you've taught in a classroom? Well, I just talked about the fact that, you know, um, I feel that, you know, in my new model of testing online, and I have open book, untimed exams, that because they have a number of essay questions, that you can't do that in the classroom necessarily, um, have the moment of assessment be the moment of acquisition. So I think my students are getting more in that sense, but I also feel that in something like a discussion board, and Alicia, who was the guest speaker, actually said that, you know, that gives her time for reflection when she can ponder the discussion question and come up with a considered response that utilizes various sources on the web. That makes, even if it is asynchronous, a much more rich and enriching um, discussion. 
And you, you can have a great energy in the classroom, but I don't necessarily think you get the same depth and level of conversation and discussion because students are thinking on the fly. They're also worried about what their class might, might think. They don't have time to prepare their responses. Mm -hmm. So I've found that the level of you know, outcome is much higher in my classes. Okay. I, um, I would agree with that. Uh, they're equivalent or, or perhaps, as you say, higher in the online course. And as I have um, developed and refined my face-to-face -face classes with my online classes, I found that um, I'm making them very, very similar. They're almost identical because all of my face-to-face -face classes are very web-enhanced. Um, and so with publishers um, providing a great deal of online material for whatever text one uses, um, I can structure that online material in both the face-to-face -face class and the online class in exactly the same way. And what I've tried to do is essentially flip my on, uh, my face-to-face -face classes so that um, they're doing that work online as are my online students. And then when they come into the classroom, they I give them a problem and they work on it in teams and then they have to put it on the smart board or that type of thing. Well, in the online class, they're doing their online um, publisher stuff, but then they're coming to the voice threads that, and they're getting that same problem posed and they're needing to um, respond and I um, make sure I grade them on the fact that they're using a variety of different voice thread components, writing and word and video, that type of thing. So there really is that interaction. Okay. And, uh, just this semester, I've just started um, totally testing this out, but having Zoom um, five-minute snippets with at various times with every single student in my online course, you know, and I'm sitting at my kitchen having my tea at night, and they're like, "Okay, so this is your time. How you doing? Everything cool? You know, that kind so of five thing." So five-minute synchronous interaction. Yep, yep, it, and it's, uh, it's they're like, "Oh my God, I've never done this before," but again, it's like, "Wow, you're really there." It just gives them that mental connection that this is real. Yeah. No. So on the question of equivalence. What... Tell you the truth, it's not just what I think. We have 10 years of data showing the differences between the two classes and then what we did to do the same thing. Like I started the other way from the live to the online and then the online to the live back and forth. So there's not that much of a difference between the pedagogy in either class now. Mm -hmm. um, because of the technology, you can do that. But I have the data that actually shows that in the beginning they did just as well as the live class, and in some instances they did better. Mm -hmm. uh, the poorest students actually did better um, because what happened was we brought them through the online class in a very structured way. Mm -hmm. They had uh, work that they had to do. They had to think through. It wasn't just rote memorization. They learned to critically problem solve. And when we put a live class without our, our um, all our resources that you know we used for the learning assets against the online. The online students actually had poor GPAs, weren't, didn't do as well coming in, and did better going out of the class. Mm -hmm. So we have 10 years of data showing that you can do this. Mm -hmm. Not only that, when we started to started this, we had a split in the curve, okay? Because the students that embraced the new way of doing things and problem solving and the more rigorous portions of you know, the online uh, atmosphere did better, pulled the curve out from under the students who didn't, and then eventually the whole curve moved. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's positive in many, many regards, um, not just for the online uh, environment, but for the live environment too, to feed back that information. <laughs> so another issue that comes out of the national studies is that faculty believe that uh, interaction with students is uh, extremely important in higher education and they do not believe that interaction with students is possible in online environments. How, how do you ensure in your classes that students have sufficient and high quality interaction with content, with each other, and with you? Uh, the first thing is uh, we set up the structure of the class in, a, in, as I said, a more democratic way. So the way the grading rubric is set up, the examples of graded discussion posts, things like that. 
the students are actually um, graded on their critical thought and their debate with each other, basically using research databases and having, you know, using falsification of science and debating each other. We stay out of those as faculty members. There are undergraduate TAs and they're mentoring the students and pushing them towards critical thought. We come in after they're finished and clarify basically a thread at a time. Okay, any thread that didn't, didn't come through and uh, clear itself up itself, we'll come in and clarify. Not specifically picking on any one student or another, just on the whole thread. And then within the grading, what we do is then we put our personal comments into each individual student. So they get both. They get the, the public forum where we comment after their discussions, and then they get comments on the grading side from us. Meanwhile, they're getting comments from the undergraduate TAs to push their critical thought. So I found that I get to know my students much, much better in this environment, and I get to know more of them better. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say I would get to know my students a lot better as well. Um, I, I just started using VoiceThreads last semester because we just got it available. So um, VoiceThreads, for those who may not know, and I think most people do know, is an asynchronous audio as and video. I right, guess, it can be an asynchronous audio, video, it could be written, yep. or you can create an offline kind of a PDF or some component that you can then upload as okay. well. So, um, and I asked each of them to uh, create an introductory um, voice thread, and I was just absolutely amazed. I mean, they posted pictures of their children and their last vacation and their pets, and, and it was just, there was so much video going on, and, and, and they were going back and forth, oh, that's really cool, whatever. It was so much uh, more lively than just the generic icebreaker uh, discussion board that I had done previously. So that right away set a tone that was very upbeat for the class. And then um, going through the course on all the different chapters that I have the voice thread uh, assignments on, again, I, I will post something and I usually begin it with a video of me. Um, so they see me, I'm right there and I'm talking about this. Uh, I could be capturing you know, uh, my screen or just uh, showing pictures and then they have to comment on it. So they've got me right there, whether, you know, whether they like it or not. And, um, and then I make sure they have a very specific way in which they need to respond. They have to use a variety of different, as I said before, methodologies. I want them to do writing, I want them to do audio, I want them to do video. They can't just use one. They have to mix it up and there's a whole rubric that I have for grading each one of their voice threads. So that, you know, it's just a check mark in a box. You've done this and then I comment on each one of their um, voice threads. So they really get a lot of interaction. Mm. I mean, I'm not sure I necessarily comment in a face to face class on every single student's, um, you know, work. And as we all know, our students themselves don't comment every single class that they're in. But um, online class, they do. Hmm. And then, of course, we'll see where the, the Zoom video goes, and we'll see how that, but I'm just, like I said, I'm just testing the, the it out. Syn so, the synchronous video. Uh, yeah, that yes. is uh, synchronous video, Zoom. Uh, that's live, whereas the voice threads is the asynchronous type of thing. So I think between both of those technologies, I think, I mean, I think there's a great deal of interaction and probably far more than in a typical face-to-face -face class. Okay. Yeah, you know, I would have to agree. I also use VoiceThread as a way to have them give presentations for one another, showing what they've learned over the course of the, you know, five weeks or seven week session. And um, that way they can all interact and they can all watch each other's presentations. And they're required to watch in depth at least five to seven other <coughs> presentations, which, um, you know, if they were sitting in a classroom, we would only have the face-to-face -face classroom, we would only have maybe a week or two weeks worth of class time, which is six hours, to give presentations. It'd be 10 minutes, it'd be short, it'd be cursory, they'd be bored. Um, this way they can get online whenever they want and they can really engage with the presentation. So you're leveraging the asynchronous nature. I, I leverage the asynchronous like you can't believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think it's, it, I said this recently when we had our online teaching expo and I made a handout to. Um, give to interested faculty about my tips after 
teaching online for four years, and one of the things I said, you know, the asynchronous nature of um, online teaching is what most people see as its challenge, but it's also the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Because it really does, not only in the most facial sense, allow them to do work whenever they're ready and able, but it also provides for that sustained contemplation and that sustained reflection. But as far as getting to know your students, I have an icebreaker that's much like Kathleen's in the sense that um, I really ask them to put themselves out there. And I, I have a little bit of an advantage being an art historian in that visual imagery is an integral part of my class and I can use that as a way to get to the learning outcomes. So their very first assignment is to post an image of themselves that they um, then have to go around and decode the iconography in the image of all the classmates. And uh, believe me, in the last two years, I've really had to put a lot of disclaimers about the difference between an intentionally posed photograph with iconography in it and a selfie. Okay? <laughs> I started to get real selfies in the last three years. Like, and I was like, no, nope, we can't tell anything about you from this except that you like makeup. You know, and I, I would say it in a real teasing, you know, gentle way. But I would show them a painting of Paul Revere by John Singleton Copley and explain what the painter was trying to get across in conveying Revere's character. And they love this assignment because they're curious, right? But nothing's given away by the image, so they get to do all the guesswork. And then the student who's being guessed, whose image is being you know, decoded and that they're guessing who you are and what you're all about, gets flattered by a lot of the guessing and comes back on and says, no, no, that's not it. Or, oh, yes, you guessed that I you know, am a musician in my spare time. And, and then the other thing I do to really boost that level of engagement, but I would say that online students spend far more time <laughs> on their class mm -hmm. than, they, than any face-to-face -face student. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, I have three hours worth of online video lectures they can watch if they want. They have links they can peruse. They have the discussion boards they have to do. They have online testing. Um, they have their voice threads assignments. But um, the other thing that I really do is that the first discussion question they have is very straightforward and it's very dry and it very much just after the icebreaker addresses the ways in which they're going to you know, meet the learning outcomes for art history. But by the end, I'm really asking them to incorporate personal beliefs and opinions in what um, they have learned about the art world. And they know each other so well by that point in time that their defenses are down. And they, I really get much more honest, kind of sincere, and curious responses to one another's, you know, admissions and essays. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you can feel the passion and creativity that you have for teaching coming through in the online environment as well as probably the classroom environment. A lot of what people are talking about, I think, get to one of the other concerns that frequently voiced by faculty, especially faculty who are inexperienced in online teaching, is that it's, it's going to be way too much time. It sounds like you spend some time doing this and you have expectations that your students will spend time doing it. Do you have concerns about the time commitment or how do you manage the time? Is it, is it more time? Say it's the same time. You just redistributed your time a little more. Um, I don't think that it's actually more time. Uh, you, you can have a rushed face-to-face -face class because there aren't enough resources, or a class that's too big, mm. or um, you know, a class that you don't have time to develop the pedagogy for in a live class, just as well as you can have for an online class. You know, I think that what part of this is showing, what everyone's saying is that if you have the resources to actually create and the time, the time and the resources to create and react as your class is spontaneously developing and interact with the students so that you develop it further and take it in the direction that it's going, then of course you will do better and you'll enjoy your job. Mm. But if you don't have the time or the resources to do any of that, I don't care what the job is, you're not going to enjoy it. And you can't spontaneously develop it into something better. You just keep reproducing what you already did because you have, don't have any time to change it and react. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's one of the biggest problems we have right now. Mm -hmm. Sufficient time. Um, I spent a tremendous amount of time, but I spent that same um, amount of time on both face-to-face -face and my online course because, again, 
Uh, I adopted a new tax and new things. I mean, it was it was a huge amount of uh, time invested. But again, the same for both. And I found, as you said, I did it up front. I, I and I I didn't mind doing it because the the more detailed it was, the more absolute it was in terms of development. Then I can relax and enjoy my students during the semester more, and then make constant notes of like, oops, that didn't work so well. This is what I'll add right. you know, over the summer. This is what I'll do, that kind of a thing. So I think any course, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, if, it, if you want it to be very specifically structured and absolute so you get certain outcomes, it takes a lot of time. But I don't think online takes more time. Okay. I disagree slightly to the extent that um, I think we're moving into a world of what I call ever time. And um, it's not that it's over time, it's that it's always the time. I mean, at, but that is also what upcoming generations do with their media and their technology. They're always on it. I have teenagers, you know, it's, it's all day scrolling through the Instagram feed. And so they um, will naturally already be online. I, I don't think, you know, if they're not watching a television show, then they're, you know, checking Facebook or they're on their phones on Instagram. So they don't mind being online more often. I think that for professors who you know, are straddling generations, it can be a change. Um, but I actually wish my face-to-face -face classes weren't necessarily longer, but met more frequently. Because um, I don't know how it works on other campuses, but we had a push a few years ago by our provost in order to get more classes slotted within a day you know, that our class time was reduced and it ended up being seven hours that we lost over the course of a semester. And if you're teaching a class that has content, you know, if you're teaching, as I do, World Art One, which is 30,000 years of art history, and you lose six hours, you can do all the methodology you want, and but you're not going to teach Still them. Still lost what a thousand you like. years somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> Easily. <laughs> so the great thing about online learning is that you can give them as they can use as much or as little as they want, and they can go beyond just succeeding in the class to flourishing, mm -hmm. not in the class necessarily, but in the topic or, or in the discipline, and that's all predicated on how much time they want to spend on it. So I want, I want to sort of start to wrap up, and one of the goals that we have is to try to understand um, the formation of positive attitudes. You obviously all have very positive attitudes. Do you have any advice for faculty who have not tried it, faculty who may have negative attitudes? What would you tell them in order to maybe start, to, uh, start a dialogue about uh, what I think may be some misperceptions or misunderstandings about the nature of the experience? Like I said, I don't think so much it's their misunderstanding. I think it's the fact that they, in order to invest in something new, they need to uh, know that the support is there mm -hmm. for them to invest in something new. And they're not naive. And mm -hmm. if they see that resources are strapped, or you're just going to throw out seed money to create a course mm -hmm. with no model to sustain a course, they're going to continue to have a negative attitude. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I really think the problem is. I don't think that you know the knowledge is the problem. I think that the ability to do a good job and problem solve is the problem. Okay. And you need to let them develop and, and work with it and work with teams of people. You know, but if we don't have you know TLT, I work with them tremendous. I mean, they're wonderful, mm -hmm. but you can't drive them into the ground either. You need support to bring money into the support systems. Okay. And if you don't have it, then of course they're going to get tired and everybody's going to get tired and then even my attitude is going to become negative. <laughs> so advocate for adequate resources, it yes. sounds like. Okay. Boots on the ground, adequate resources. Okay. <laughs> the well, advice for faculty. Yeah, yeah at least in my institution with our instructional technologies group. Um, my uh, mindset has always been sort of leap and the net will appear. Um, and, and it has. Uh, as I said, they're tremendous and Dr. Dugan has been great. Uh, so I offered to um, put uh, any faculty who wanted links into my COIL course, I gave them links so they could see what I was doing. 
um, you know, in the hopes that, and it, you know, things would be reciprocal back, you know, in the future type of thing. So um, I, I just, you know, share what you have. They'll share what they have. We'll all get better, and and use the resources that we have because it's it's it could be scary, but at least at our institution, we've got what we need to make it successful. I think um, one of the misperceptions about uh, teaching online is that you no longer control the classroom. And um, I know for me that I raised my game as a teacher when I lost my ego um, <laughs> due to personal illness. And I realized that my ego had no place in the classroom any longer. And I was always a dynamic teacher, but I wasn't necessarily as, if I, and this is me being completely honest, invested truly in success of my students until my ego got out of it. And I think that it's understandable we're in a field that is, for the most part, not necessarily well respected by the general public. There's a lot of misperceptions just about professors and their commitment to students as it is. And the classroom is one place that the professor still gets to shine and, you know, be the spotlight, in the spotlight to some extent. And especially if you teach a lecture-based class. And your success in that lecturing can depend on how dynamic and charismatic you actually are. But we're moving away from that model in every sphere of life. We are moving away from the top-down model and the big ego telling the peons what they should do. And so I think if you really want to raise your game as a professor altogether, online teaching is one of the ways to do it because your ego is not there and it can't be. Because as I say, you know, nowadays, if I were teaching online, well, it wouldn't happen that way, but you know, teaching 30 years ago in face-to-face -face format, I could tell my students anything, and they wouldn't know what happened in medieval Europe unless they went and got a text out of the Oxford Boolean Library. You know, they would really have to go to that level to find that information. So I was kind of the keeper of the, of the knowledge. Now, my students can go to the Oxford Boolean Library online, <laughs> and they have often come up with stuff I have no idea, that I've never read before, and I have to admit that, and I also have to graciously model learning from them and seeing how they can enrich my course and how they can teach my students and their fellow classmates. And it's been an eye-opening and wonderful experience for me to see the learning go this way instead of this way. Yeah. Or th it goes this way sometimes, you know? Often they, they teach me, but I like to describe it as a, you know, exchange model mm. rather than one way, so. It's terrific. I, I want to thank all three of our panelists today. Um, I know that Alan just got some work in <laughs> um, I, I think what we just heard is sort of a more nuanced depiction of what the experience of teaching online is like, it, including its creativity, the dedication, sort of the passion um, that I hope would help folks who have never done this understand that it is truly a creative enterprise. And I think you guys have done a terrific job in, in articulating that today. So thank you. Alex, how, how do you want to do this? So, um, so she's a, the master of ceremonies. <laughs> um, so we have uh, this new program, uh, the Online Teaching Ambassador Program. And what we did was we um, went to the directors of online teaching, uh, uh, online learning at each of the campuses and the instructional designers and asked them to nominate two faculty from their institution. Um, we got responses uh, from 26 uh, campuses and um, we have 56 um, uh, people who uh, were nominated by their campuses and um, we invited a subgroup of those uh, who were nominated to attend the summit and participate in this uh, research study and um, and from that group we invited um, um, our three panelists to be part of the panel and so I just want to thank all of the nominators all of the nominees and our panelists and Peter and the researchers who are here. Daphne, can you raise your hand? 
um, and Lisa, um, and I think the, uh, there were others who were he here today um, interviewing the faculty. Uh, but while we have been having our sessions, uh, the research project has been going on in uh, upstairs in uh, in one of the rooms. And I just want to, um, you know, thank the campuses and the folks who nominated and the folks who were nominated for uh, their engagement and participation um, um, in this event, but also um, for being, rec um, you know, uh, they were nominated and are being recognized for being um, uh, online teaching ambassadors. And those are um, very loosely, you know, the, the criteria was that they be exemplary online faculty who have enthusiasm for online teaching and who are willing to be advocates uh, with the online community um, that we all live in, in SUNY, uh, which includes those who are interested, those who um, have skepticism, those who are very, very enthusiastic and everything in between. And so I just want to thank you. If you were recognized, are being recognized as an ambassador, could you please raise your hand? I just want to see how many of us are here. Um, so, um, uh, on the website there are links where you can actually see um, um, the, the list of, of um, uh, faculty who, from whom I have received bios. We did a little bio and a little testimonial and picture for each of the faculty on the web pages and that link is in the, in the website. And, um, and for those of you who may not um, maybe have not um, nominated uh, from your campus, um, there's also a link there where you can get more information about how to nominate um, faculty from your campus. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I would like to have ambassadors from each of our SUNY campuses represented, and it's just as easy um, as contacting us for, to get more information so that we can um, make, you know, have the correct nominator uh, send us the names of their nominees. Um, so for those who are here, um, I don't, I'm not sure how to do this, but um, um, I, I have the list alphabetically. Um, and I think uh, uh, from you, the nominator from UAlbany was Chris Moore. Uh, and I think um, Gina Giuliano is here. Are you here, Gina? Oh, come on over. Um, Kim, do you want to come? I'm going to step behind you. Okay, you can do that. I just want to. Oh, great. Thank you. Nice. Oh, you want to move it? Now hold it. Yeah. I so sorry. Thank you so much. That's so funny. No, no. Um, uh, so, uh, Stephanie Afnito, Andrea Kordzek, and Max Lifschitz, as well as Jean Wei Zhang, were also nominated from U Albany. Uh, from Alfred State, it was Danielle Green, and that was Ellen Seide who nominated her. Um, from Binghamton University, um, Andrea McCargo uh, nominated Chelsea Bohinsky and Erin Cody. I don't believe either of those are here. Um, Chris Price from Brockport uh, nominated uh, Beth Heavey and Alicia Chase, both of whom are here. Let's do Beth first. Let's do Alicia first. Oh, there she is. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Yay, Beth.
Congratulations. Congratulations. Your check is in the mail. I'm sure. <laughs> Yay, Alicia! All right, let's see who we have next. We have um, from Buffalo State. We have Carol Denishin, nominated by Megan Piera. Um, Carol, are you here? Oh, there you are! There you are! Um, and uh, Uma um, from Buffalo State, Uma Gupta, also nominated by Megan Pierre. Um, from Buffalo University, Ann Reed nominated Mara Rumfala, um, Beth Atopio, and Kate Conroy. Kate. Hello. Um, uh, Vicki Sloan nominated, this is from Clinton, uh, Chris Ford, Janice Padula, Tyson Abbott, and Dennis Sweeney, none of whom are here. Oops, sorry. Uh, Martha Gold from Corning nominated Tyson Abbott and Dennis Sweeney. Um, none of those are here. Um, Michelle Rogers Estab Estabal uh, from Delhi nominated Jamie Murphy and Tracy Caponera. I don't believe either of them are here. Um, uh, Chuck Spuchis um, um, nominated Brandon Murphy and uh, Rick Beal. And I believe Brandon's here. Um, we have 
uh, Farmingdale is uh, Dr. Maureen Tsokoris, uh, nominated by Maya, Be Maya Bentz, and also Dr. Marjorie Brown, uh, neither of whom are here. From Finger Lakes, we have uh, Ryan McCabe nominating Stephanie Olson and Christopher Parker. I don't believe either of them are here. From FIT, we have Rena Silverman and Lourdes Font. Um, let's have Rena. Well, we also have to self-advocate for. Yeah, we have to self-advocate for in my mind. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, and from Fredonia, we have Lisa Maluski, who nominated Daniela Paterka um, Benton. And um, Lisa also nominated Kathleen Gradle, neither of whom are here, I believe, from Herkimer. Um, we have um, Bill Pels and uh, Karen Nagel. Can you, are you guys ready to come on down? I am, because I'm going to have my interview at nine. So. Um, from Maritime, we um, have Ian August, who nominated Paul Kump and Captain Eric Johansson, who was here yesterday, and I gave him his certificate yesterday. Congratulations to both Paul and Eric. Um, from Monroe, we have uh, Kathleen Borby and Elizabeth Kelly, both nominated by Kelly. Uh, sorry. And um, from Nassau Community College, Debbie Spiro nominated Allison Guest and Susan Maurer, neither of whom are here with us. Um, Lisa Dubuck from Niagara nominated Sue Siegman um, and Lynn Brochu. Sue was here. She's not? Okay. All right. Oh, that's right. Okay. I remember now. Um, but congratulations to them both, and thank you, Lisa. Um, Greg Ketchum, who I know is watching right now, um, uh, nominated Sarah Bonzo and Mary Tone Rogers. Mary, I think that you are here. I thought you were here. Perhaps not. Okay. Um, and Penny Haynes from Schenectady nominated Matthew Farron and uh, Papa Guy. Um, also, neither of whom are here, and um, so, but congratulations to them. Um, Stony Brook, um, Charles Tauber nominated Marilyn London. Marilyn, are you here? I thought perhaps you might be. Um, and Stephanie Foote, I don't believe Stephanie's here either. Um, Charles Tauber also nominated Charles Harris, who I know is not here. Uh, Lee Zipolitos uh, nominated Kelly Walker. Kelly, are you here? Okay, she's not here. Congratulations, Kelly. Um, also nominated was Paula Timoney. I don't believe she's here. 
Um, but last but not least, um, Wendy Tang nominated Jane Souza. I know you are here because you were on our panel. Okay, and I think um, we have um, Amber Melvin from Sullivan nominated Jessica Barkle and Art Regal. Congratulations to them. From SUNY Poly, um, Catherine Stam and Naren uh, Peribotla uh, were nominated, and they were nominated by Carol Berger, who is no longer at um, SUNY Poly, but I just wanted to have a shout out to Carol. Um, uh, and um, and that wraps up our, um, our recognitions of the online uh, teaching ambassadors. So thank you very much. Congratulations to all of you. The online teaching ambassador program is an annual program. And as I said, they will receive the, uh, the certificate as well as the badge as an online teaching ambassador. They will have opportunities over the next year um, to be advocates and to share their enthusiasm from, for online teaching with the uh, large community of faculty that we have that mostly fall in the you know, I don't like, I don't believe in, or I'm not sure uh, category of online, um, you know, faculty. So I'm very excited to have you join COAT to participate in this event. Thank you so much. And and this is the end of our second day of the summit. We have one more day to go, a wonderful program uh, tomorrow um, with uh, our Newton engagement. We're going to hear from Kevin Bell about um, uh, gamification. And that's actually not gamification, but I can't remember the exact title of his uh, of his uh, talk, and Christy Ford from UMUC, who's going to talk about um, instructional design with us. And then we're going to have an interactive activity to round out the day. Um, again, for dinner, if you want to gather and try and meet people in the um, hotel uh, bar area to find other people to go out to dinner with. There's lists of restaurants that are on the website um, that are in this area that were put together for us by the folks at the Global Center. Um, thank you all for spending the day with us and for your engagement and your enthusiasm and your presence here. I appreciate you all. And I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early, 8 o'clock for breakfast. As a reminder, if you um, are interested in hearing what we're doing for the new um, service offering for training faculty, um, stick around. We're going to probably start that in a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs>